Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Saeed Serafazadeh to our At Home with Literati series in support of American Estrangement and in conversation this evening with author Porachista Kakpur. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase American Estrangement from Literati throughout the event. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time. And I will ask a selection of those questions uh, on your behalf at the conclusion of the conversation. Live transcription is also available on your toolbar as well. Um, and of course, if you're watching us later on uh, YouTube, there are always links to purchase books uh, in the description directly below me. And please be sure to subscribe as well to make sure you stay up to date with all of our at home with literati events this year as a reminder you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the united states and of course if you live in southeast michigan or the ann arbor area our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping most of all we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon depending on uh, where and when in the world you may be joining us from so without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Saeed Serafazadeh was born in Brooklyn and raised in Pittsburgh. He is the author of a memoir, When Skateboards Will Be Free, and a story collection, Brief Encounters with the Enemy. He's the recipient of a winning award and a Coleman Center Fellowship. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Granta, The New York Times Magazine, and McSweeney's. He teaches at New York University and Hunter College and lives in New York City. And Porachista Kakpur's debut novel, Sons and Other Flammable Objects, was a New York Times editor's choice. Her second novel, The Last Illusion, was a 2014 best book of the year, according to NPR, Kirkus Reviews, BuzzFeed, Pop Matters, Electric Lit, and many more. Among her many fellowships is a National Endowment for the Arts Award. Her nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Elle, Slate, Salon, Book Forum, among many others. Born in Tehran and raised in the Los Angeles area, Kakpur currently lives in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Saeed and Porchista into your living room. Thank Thanks, you, John. So much, John. It's so nice to be here. It's, I, thank, I, you for, I so, thank you for doing this. I was so pleased that you asked. I'm such a fan of yours and I've always had so much fun. I feel like we were trying to remember when we first connected. And it must have been over a decade ago and I can't even believe it. And it was like an AWP panel maybe. And then we, you were a guest at a art school in Santa Fe where I taught at. And, and then I had just been following you like crazy because I followed every, every Iranian writer that would like, you know, have a debut and then they'd be all over the place, especially if they were in New York. I was so obsessed. And I started reading your work. I think it was initially, I saw it in Mr. Beller's neighborhood. Was that Possibly. Was yeah, I think yes. that's the first place. And I was like, I know this. Okay, Saeed Saraf Sada, of course, I know this. This is an Iranian person. And I was just <laughs> like, wow, I hope I meet him. And it, then we met and we just so hit it off. But I still remember it was like right around, it was right before you had gotten your teaching jobs. And it might have been just as you were starting to publish in The New Yorker. Or was it right before? I think we met before. And, and I think the AWP was in D.C., oh, yeah. if, if that's if that's. Yeah. My memory serves me. Right. Um, right. Well, it's and great. To, thank you for doing this. It's so great. It's such an honor. And I'm so happy like to see. I'm so happy that we, we have this treat, American Estrangement, which everybody needs to buy. So great to have like your third book here. It's so it goes so well with your other books, too. I feel like I'm like I have all your books here and it's just like I've read them so deeply and I appreciate them so much. And it's so satisfying to when you see like the next, like there's something about book number three, I feel like where now you have a very strong sense of what the author's voice is like mm -hmm. and who they are. And of course, like I know you, so I have a sense of that, but you are one of those writers actually that like, when I read it, your work, I hear it in your voice and I very much understand that sensibility. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about you is that mix of someone who is equally very serious, but also very funny. And so that balance 
it's, it's, it actually seems so obvious, but it's very, very difficult. Like if, when I try to do those two modes, I tip so heavily into one or the other. And there's such a great restraint here. So I found myself when I was reading American Estrangement, there were so many stories where I was like on the verge of crying or on the verge of like laughing hysterically. Mm-hmm. It's something just so singular about you. I don't even know what I'm asking here, but I want to say like, did it feel like, you know, putting this together? I mean, obviously a lot of these stories have been published in major venues. You clearly must have known that these were like great to put together. Did it feel like this is like, okay, we've arrived. This is the third book. This is my voice. This is who I am. Um, That's a bomb here. <laughs> a bomb. What's that? Say again? That's a bit of a bomb of a question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good question. I, I no, I think, I do think my voice has changed slightly from the beginning, but I think just slightly. So I, I think what I was doing in the, in the memoir, um, you know, cause you said the balance between humor and sadness. Thank you for saying that. I am definitely trying to achieve that. I'm looking for that mix. Um, I, I, I feel like I have certain alarms that go off in my head when something is getting too maudlin and it kind of corrects me and goes, okay, we need, now, I'm not trying to say I'm trying to, <clears throat> I'm not trying to undercut scenes. I'm not trying to make something that's heavy. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to um, not acknowledge the weight of it, but I do look for moments of levity, even if it's just something that's absurd or ironic, something that I can throw in there. Um, listen, I think if you had read me years before, pre, pre-memoir, pre when I was even publishing anywhere, it would have been super sad. Everything would have been sad. I loved being heavy. I, I, it, it was my worldview um, and I put it on the page. And at some point, honestly, therapy helped me, helped me find, find some lightness in things. And, um, and I realized the stuff that I was writing was not stuff that I necessarily wanted to read myself. So I, I, I evolved, I changed, I wrote, I wrote what I wanted to read. And um, so I think this, this third book is sort of a continuation of that, of that trajectory. But you, I gotta quit, because you said you, you find that you either go too heavy or too sad. So, yeah. so do you like in your, so is Balance that something is you, hard for me. Balance you adjust? Is hard. Do you find that you adjust? Are you adjusting in drafts? I find it sort of, um, that's a really good question. It, it, I, I'm so inelegant as a human that I sort of <laughs> allow myself to teeter sometimes disastrously in one direction or the other, just so sometimes I can see what happens, sure. you know? And, and sometimes that's a, a really bad instinct and sometimes it leads to interesting things, but, but it, is a, it is a struggle of mind balance as both a person and as a writer. And it is just very, very hard. I admire nothing more than when people have that sort of control and restraint. And, and, and I think it goes back to like being an observer. I mean, I think something that you have that is unique, not entirely unique, because there's a few writers who have this, but there's something that I always think about. And it was when you, when I first encountered your work, you talked about it and it's your theater background. And I feel like when I'm reading your work, I want to read it out loud because I hear the dialogue is so real. Everything feels so real in a way, but not in the hammy, cheap, amateur actor way. It's like the way, like, you know, I've never seen you act, actually, but I can imagine you're... Excellent. Nor will you, probably. <laughs> Nor will you. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to, damn it. I feel like there's like, there's there's something so... Um, I, I don't even know if that's part of your process, but I always, I always remember it because okay. it's like, it feels to me like, you know, there's several like uh, um, writers who were actors who had theater backgrounds of some sort. You know, I think about like Donald Antrim, for instance, or, you know, there's probably a lot more than we even know, you know, um, people sometimes don't talk about it that much. Um, but like, I have really felt it in the different characters here because you have a way of getting into like the brains of like almost 
everybody in cities, you know? And I think of you as very much also a city writer, you know, like very much so. Yeah. Yeah. So that whole thing, how much is that still like, is that, is that still like a question that like you find relevant, the theater one? Yeah, I do. I do. Again, thank you for noticing. Um, and I do want to also make comment on the, on the city that I'm a city writer, but the theater, Hey, Hey, you know, the thing though, that's weird is, um, or, or I don't know if you feel this, but like my, my dialogue is kind of limited. Like I don't use a lot. Um, so, which is, which I don't know if that's, if that's sort of a paradox, given that I was a, an actor and then I wanted to be, I was a playwright, or I guess I still am a playwright, but you know, which is all dialogue. But yet when I come to, when it comes to prose for me, I'm very, I think for me, it's also a relief not to have to use so much dialogue because I found it very difficult to have to convey everything through dialogue in a script and what a relief to actually have a narrative voice that could just tell the reader what is happening. So oddly enough, the dialogue is very limited. I, I even wonder if I went through the collection, if there's even a di- even if there's two sentences strung together in someone's dialogue, I'm not sure. Because I think a lot of it is very just quick sound bites that I use. Um, what I do know about theater there's a couple things. One is as an actor, I don't know how this translates into the prose. I was, I, I wanted people to stare at me when I was on stage. The worst thing for an actor is to not be noticed. And so if I was on stage with whoever, however many other actors, and maybe this is my, my downfall as an actor, I'm fine to say that career is over. <laughs> if it was a career, I, um, I was, um, I wanted all eyes on me. I think what happens in my prose is I'm, I don't want to ever bore the reader. I don't ever want to bore the reader. I want to figure out ways to keep their attention. Maybe that's what every writer feels like. I don't know if I, if it's, I feel it more acutely. Um, I think the other thing I do, which again is maybe what every writer does, but I'm also aware as I was on stage as an actor of the way things look, if it's the lighting, if it's the way things are being said, um, if it's props. You know, I think the thing about a short story, at least the ones that I write, is that I'm trying to compress a lot into a limited amount of words. That's what a story does. I don't have all day. I gotta, I gotta get in and get out. So I'm very conscious of that when I introduce a, a prop or an object in one of my stories that it should have some sort of meaning that's more than just the meaning of that particular prop. If it's a pen or a typewriter, is there something more to say about it? Will it reappear? Again, possibly a theater uh, throwback from, you know, and maybe also the kind of theater I did, which was low budget, so we didn't have much money. So that meant we would buy whatever props were really essential. I guess that's what it comes down to is what's essential for these stories. Maybe that's coming from theater. The second part though, the city thing is, I'm so glad you brought that up because yes, yes, I'm a city writer. And and I think by that, I, I think it's, the city becomes a central character in my stories. Um, I'm, I think so, I think I'm thinking through all of these, but yeah, I think it becomes a character. I'm, I'm not even sure, you know, poor Jesus, some of this stuff is who the hell are we, what are we conscious of and what we're not. Some, sometimes I think that's the thing that's actually motivated me to write it, is the city itself to try to convey what is life like in the city. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I don't ever name Pittsburgh in this book, but you know, and some of the sm- there are some of these stories take place in smaller mid-sized cities. That's Pittsburgh floating in there. That's me wanting to convey. It's so well done. It's such a like, you know, there's like I could totally feel like what what like your cities are always. And it feels very real. They're always a little bit like there's a sense of something sometimes ominous and tense, but then there's also something kind of like lively and like things are surviving. And it's just like 
I don't know. It's really, there's so much that's so moving here. I also really like that, like, we have, like, you know, we've talked to, obviously, you and I get, like, you know, there's there's lots of, like, Iranian writers. There's no, there's no, like, lack of them. But, you know, there's a way in which some of us in the literary world get very spotlit for our, like, ethnicities and obviously the race and all these other identifiers. But, you know, it is, it's, I often say that there's never been a very, like, good or bad time to be Iranian American. There's just always been a time to be Iranian American. It's always- It's very funny. It's very know? funny. Yeah. And it's like, it was a real delight, like reading, like I really love the story, Beginning's Guide to Estrangement. And just there's, I always am very excited when there is like Iranian characters and you talk about Iran, your piece. So I know at different times you've mentioned, like, you know, sometimes, remember, I actually, I just remembered this, actually, you were in my Iranian American issue of Gornica that I edited oh, that's like right. a decade that's ago. Right. Yeah, it was so weird. That was a decade ago. But I remember there was a, one of the questions that I posed to a lot of you guys in there was like, how much do you identify as Iranian? Because that's always like a complicated question, because we're all here in the US for different reasons. Some of us would have been here anyway. Some of us are immigrants, some of us are refugees, you know, the circumstances vary, even though politics wants to just clump us as one but it was a real delight for me I love this and and I wanted to ask you about that too like what is it like for you to actually you know you don't always write about Iranians or, you know how does it feel for you to go in that direction how does it feel writing as an Iranian now especially given even the news cycle is so heavily focused on our part of the world almost always but especially now too well I was actually if I I'm wondering how I responded to that question that you asked 10 years ago, because I don't know how you feel, but I feel like these answers constantly change. Yes. Um, so I have, I, I mean, I, I wonder if I'm still feeling the same way. Hey, listen, that's another thing about theater. Uh, I mean, I would be remiss if, if I didn't bring this up. I mean, one of the big issues for me with being an actor was that I was only being called to audition for roles that were Middle Eastern, Right. Or or Indian, because it, it was all the same. Right. Um, and and the roles were very I'm not exaggerating. They were, you know, it was taxi cab driver. It was um, terrorist. It was third world despot. And God. I and part of the issue is I also couldn't get. So I wasn't able to get work, but I also wasn't able to get any better as an actor because I wasn't being hired. Um, I was also doing, like I was going out for roles that I wouldn't have even wanted. Um, it was humiliating. Mm. I would have to do things in an accent when I would audition. Oh. So then I'm so then I'm like, I'm mocking my father because my father's the one who's from Iran. I, I guess I'm mocking him. I'm 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 imitating him for the delight of others. It was a bad bad scene, no pun intended, and. What I found so liberating about prose is that I didn't have to write always from the pers always from my ethnicity. That didn't have to be the subject of my writing always. It felt very liberating to be able to take on different personas, to talk about different subject and to leave that part aside and then to talk about it. Because as you pointed out, there's one story in here that is strictly about Iran and it's about someone who has assimilated and who lives in the United States, but's going back to Iran. And, and also parenthetically, I was thinking about you because I said, God damn, I hope I'm portraying Tehran. I hope I'm doing an accurate job because that shit was all YouTube video. For Jesus, it was all YouTube. I was like looking at YouTube videos. I was like, what does it look like? Because I've never been, I've never been. So I had to, <laughs> that was my research. Incredible. So well done. Okay, thank God. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> you know, thank you. Thank you. It's for scary it. for any of us to write about it though, because there's always going to be some Iranian who's going to like criticize us for you. Like, no, no, that's that's how it. our people are. <laughs> you just have to accept it. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, but you know, um, the the idea of race. I mean, my first introduction to not to the idea that one didn't always have like that race didn't have to be the thing that defined you was reading Giovanni's room. I was in college, probably before I even thought about being a writer, but I knew I loved James Baldwin and then I'm reading Giovanni's Room and, and he's writing from a, I had never read that. I had never read a, 
a black person who was writing from a white person's perspective and race was not a part of the book. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. I didn't know that was an option. I think that sunk into my unconscious very deeply and I held on to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, a huge part of, of acting and then what has transpired in these stories or in my writing in general is that I can, I can express myself. I wasn't able to ever do that before. I love that. It's... How was I going to express myself, you know, with a, with a, you know, two lines as a cab driver or as a deli owner? So yeah. Right. It's so it's when you're writing, when you're composing these two, are you reading them out loud? Like, is that a big, is there like a feeling like that? Is it the same process in a sense, getting into a role or even playwriting? I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I, well, I don't know if, if you do this as well. I'm always like, I'm muttering my line. I'm muttering it. Same. I, yeah. I wrote some of these in the NYU uh, library. Right. And somebody, one of the students, she was like, could you stop? <laughs> could you stop talking? And I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was just, blah, 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 blah. Um, wow. so yeah, I guess I, yeah, it's, it's there. Do you do that? Do you, do you mind? I do, I, but it was only like somewhat in the recent years that I realized not everybody does that. And for me, it was, was hmm. more like a journalistic impulse. Like when, when you get like copy editing training and stuff, they always just tell you like read out loud. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. A lot of my stuff goes back to like journalism stuff, but it's like, you know, I simply will miss things, but at the same time, you know, it's important to know how things sound, but I'll still do like a reading and I'll want to edit every sentence as I'm reading it out loud. And I'll just be like, Oh, you know, it's Oh, like, as you're reading. Yeah, I've in had two moment. on readings in the moment. I went right, to Johns right. back to my alma mater, Johns Hopkins, a few years ago, and like, well, this was over a decade ago, but it was like an important reading, and I just suddenly like flipped out. The pressure that school hit me all at once, and I just started like, like editing every sentence of my first novel as I was reading, and it turned into some like bizarre, like avant garde garble, and it was just like. Okay. I was so I was like what am I doing and just like everybody was like congrats on your first book and I was like clearly I hate it because I just tried to literally rewrite it as a live performance like it's a mess I mean speaking of which we should we need to hear you read yeah 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 love, love that love but there that. is do you enjoy do you enjoy reading out loud yes hey going back to the theater that's that's yeah. the time I can now you know, at least salvage some of my, you know, training on the stage and be a performer. So, um, yeah, You're so I've got a, a I, um, a treat for us. So I'm going to read from, um, the story is called Fairground. And I don't think I, I'll just start from the beginning and I'll read for, you know, eight, 10 minutes. Um, so Fairground. I've only been to one hanging in my life, and that was when I was six or seven years old, or maybe I was eight, but who can really remember that far back with complete accuracy? This also happened to be during the period when the city was being rezoned, Sector A, now Sector G, Sector G, now Sector Q and R, and so on, thanks to the mayor who'd won by a landslide. It was going to take a while for everyone to get used to the changes, but everyone agreed that it would be worth it in the end. Sometimes when I was out walking with my mom, we would pass a row of school buses lined up like ducks at the crosswalk, waiting for the light to turn green, the faces of the secured populations, looking through the windows with indifference and resignation, as if they'd been traveling for weeks across the country rather than hours across the city. They would be crammed into the buses, children too, twice as many as the bus could comfortably hold, their belongings piled on their laps, often higher than their heads, suitcases, backpacks, lamps without lampshades. If you could carry it, you could bring it. That was the directive. That seemed fair. Don't stare, my mother would say. It's not polite. What I do remember for sure is that I'd been taken to the hanging as something of an afternoon diversion by Mr. Montgomery, my stepfather, the first stepfather in a sequence of several, and with full consent of my mother, who considered the outing a good opportunity for me to bond with a man I'd just met a few weeks earlier. You'll learn to love him, she told me, an upbeat prediction that as far as I could see was based on little evidence. The day trip with Mr. Montgomery had also been a way for my mother to have some alone time, 
so she could study for her upcoming exam. Because this also happened to be during that period when she'd gone back to school, mid thirties, trying to do something different with her life, something meaningful and become a librarian. If all went well, she'd soon be able to get us out of our apartment above the nail salon where we'd been living for a year and where the scent of nail polish would waft up through the vents between the hours of 10 and six. I thought it smelled nice and my mother thought it smelled annoying. And eventually we were so used to it that we no longer smelled it at all. She told me that she'd take me downstairs one of these days so that I could have my nails painted at a half price, half price being one of the perks of living ab above a nail salon. Think about what color you want, she'd said. What colors do they have, I asked. They have every color. Then I want blue, I said. No, you have to dream bigger than that, she said. She listed colors I had known were colors. Orange, cream, dream, tiger blossom, tickle my heart, Timberland, violet. Tiger blossom, I said. Good choice. Seeing Mr. Montgomery and me off on that fall afternoon, she'd stood in the doorway of our apartment, Dewey Decimal study guide under her arm, telling us, have fun, boys. Oh, we will, Mr. Montgomery had said. But the prospect of an outing with me had apparently made Mr. Montgomery contemplative, unexpectedly so. And he'd sat in the parked car for a while, saying nothing, hands on the wheel, key in the ignition, motor off, gazing through the windshield that I knew not what. I'd sat there too, wondering if we were having car trouble. Finally, he turned to me, eyes moist, saying how, how it had just occurred to him right then, how he was passing the tradition downward. Do you know what I'm talking about, son, he'd asked. No, I didn't. Yes, I said, I do. He seemed moved by this. He rubbed the back of my neck with something like fondness. The sensation was unfamiliar, but pleasant. According to Mr. Montgomery, when he'd been a boy about my age, six, seven, or eight, he'd been taken to his very first execution by his father, as had his father before him, and so on down the generational line, great, 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 grand. I was dubious that Mr. Montgomery had ever been a boy my age, let alone a boy at all, but he appeared to remember the past with emotion. Like yesterday, he told me. He wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. The back of his hand looked old. This was what fathers did with sons, he said. This was what I would one day do with my sons. He spoke with confidence and assertion. I understand, Mr. Montgomery, I said. You don't have to call me Mr. Montgomery, he said. I won't, I said. He wanted me to call him by his first name, William, or one of the variations thereof. You can call me Will or Willie. You can call me Bill or Billy. It was an hour to the fairground and the reminiscences were going to make us late. He leaned forward in his seat as if doing so made the car go faster. Through the windshield, the scenery of the city passed by at an alarming rate, occasionally broken by a flash of white space where trees and grass had been eliminated and where we could briefly glimpse the towering snow-capped mountains beyond which lay the next city. Frankly, I didn't know what my mother saw in Mr. Montgomery. They seemed to have nothing in common, beginning with the fact that Mr. Montgomery's primary experience in a public library had been to use the public bathroom. I needed to pee bad, he'd said. I didn't find this funny, but he and my mother sure did. And they told the anecdote jo jointly and often, interpreting the distance that separated them on the com compatibility index as something that strengthened their bond rather than a troubling indicator that they were all wrong for each other. Still, the first time I'd met Mr. Montgomery had been for dinner at Applebee's, which had been a promising start. I'd worn slacks and my mother had worn lipstick. They'd sat side by side in the big burgundy booth and I'd sat across to them as if they were as if as if they were interviewing me for a job, everyone's hands folded politely on the table. Mr. Montgomery had told me that I could order anything I wanted off the menu, and this added to the air of promise. Sky's the limit, he'd said. He was showing off for my mother. He's going to learn to love you, my mother had said to him. I knew he was trying to curry favor with me. I knew he knew I was the lone obstacle for him being able to sleep with my mother. So I ordered the most expensive thing off the menu. Why not? The double glazed baby back ribs, which I'd never heard of before. Apparently, this was the wrong choice. Don't be presumptuous, my mother said. How about the mac and cheese, Mr. Montgomery said. He was referring me to the children's menu. 
So I acquiesced and ordered the typical child's fare, chicken fingers and French fries. Why not get a milkshake to go with that? Mr. Montgomery said, trying to prove that he was actually easygoing with money. Yummy, my mother had said. Now, I said. We arrived at the fairground with barely time to spare. The parking lot was filled to capacity and people were streaming through the big white gate above which read Sector N welcomes you to the city fairground. Soon, this would have to be changed to Sector V. Mr. Montgomery drove around looking for an empty spot, cursing, going in circles, apologizing for cursing, talking philosophically about how this was everyone else's fault, that this was what happened when you stopped paying attention. Big crowds, little sensitivity, no parking. Everything is connected, son. Yes, he was happy that the turnout was good because good turnout meant that there was civic pride, but civic pride comes at a cost, he said. Back in my day, he, he extemporized about the past. I said nothing. Do you know what I'm talking about, he said. He didn't wait for an answer. Suddenly he turned to me. There's gonna be blood today, son, he said, as if we were only now realizing what this excursion was all about. Are you okay with blood? He sounded concerned. He sounded as if he was prepared to turn the car around if I had answered no. I wanted to be okay with blood, but I wasn't so sure. I still had scabs on my knees from a few weeks earlier when my mom had tried to teach me how to ride a bicycle. And just when I was getting the hang of it, I crashed into the sidewalk. My mother had comforted me briefly, sweetly, cradling me in her lap. And two women from the nail salon had come over wearing aprons, smelling of polish. You have to get right back on, honey, they'd said. I like blood, sir, I told Mr. Montgomery. He liked that I liked blood. Good boy, he said. You don't have to call me, sir. All right, that's where we'll end. For the folks out there, they've got to buy the book if they want to see what's, what happens next. It's so good. It's such a delight hearing you read. And it's just like, ah, I just love it because there's so much to learn from your work too. And I've taught you for so many years too. That's another question I had is that like, to me, you're, you, you obviously you've done a memoir and you've done short story collections. You seem to be so comfortable in the short story form, which I think is actually misleadingly easy. It's actually not easy at all. I find it much harder, I mean, but I'm a novelist hundred percent. I, I do write short stories, but they're sometimes they take five times as long as a draft of a novel for me. I mean, I, I'm literally working on a short story that I started in 2002 right now. I'm still working on it. So it just takes me so long. So do you feel like, like, are you in your just total comfort zone short stories and you just, you're sticking to short stories or do you feel like you, you want to go into the novel or is it a foreign beast for you the way that like short stories are for me sometimes? Yeah, um, I think, well, first of all, thank you for saying it, that, that they're hard, because I was thinking, is it just me? Yes, they're hard. I mean, I, I would love to hear why you say they're hard. I, for me, it's, well, some of what I was saying earlier is that I've got to, I've got limited time. I've got to convey information very quickly without seemingly, without seeming like I'm conveying the information quickly. You know, I want it to seem organic, that it's just unfolding. Right. It's, it's, to me, it's sort of a mathematical problem of how to fit pieces into the, a story, into that framework. I've, I, I do think I've got some sense of when there's, when I've built up enough, uh, I've never said this phrase out loud, I'm just coining it, like, enough emotional capital that something could pay off now. And now I can get onto the downslope of the story. I've also got to figure out how to get out of a story. And the best case for me is when, the, when, I, when I know the ending when I start, because then I've got that finish line. What's tough is if I don't know the ending and then it's like I'm driving through fog and I'm just going, I hope <laughs> in the next 20 feet, things will clear and I'll go, bam, that's how we do it. Um, right. One of these stories I wrote, uh, like a few of them, but there's one story, the first one actually, which mm -hmm. is about uh, the character is possibly becoming addicted to crack cocaine. We don't know. Um, it's looking like it's going down that path. What I did was I actually wrote a longer version where I kind of just said it all. Here's what happens. And, and, and that in the version of the story that I came up with, yes, 
it's confirmed that he's addicted. And then I cut, those were like four pages. And then I just said, fuck it, let me cut it. And we'll just end on the, I get, okay, here's, here's theater again. What's gonna happen next? Note lights up, we're done, plays over. That's it. So I wanted that feeling. I wanted the feeling of the, the reader going, what's gonna happen next? And then we don't know, you turn the page, it's over. Um, I, what am I talking about? I feel like I've lost. What am I? Have, have I lost the thread? What were you? No, doing? you did it no, so no, no. great. This is like a great. Yeah. It, oh, it was a short story form versus the novel. Yeah. Yes. So with my memoir, let's just say that's a not. I mean, it's it's a it's a full length book. Um, yeah. I mean, different. A whole different thing. A whole different way to approach. Uh, plenty of time to indulge and digress, and expand and blah, blah, blah. And the arc is different, I guess. It's just a longer arc. Um, you know, the main thing for me, this is slightly off the novel versus story thing, but it's fiction versus nonfiction. Mm. Um, I mean, and you do both. And I, there's again, something liberating about the fiction because now I don't, I'm not, I'm not married to fact anymore. I found that that's, you know, that has its own, and there's a reason why it's, it's, it's confining fact. You know, even when I was writing my memoir, I was like, should I wish it had happened a different way? Cause it'd be easier to tell that story or it'd be more right. dramatic to tell it that way. And it was after I finished the memoir, when I started with stories and I went here, here. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, there's no facts. Anything can go, but then that's also what sucks because then it's all your imagination. It's all on you. You do not have, I, I didn't, I no longer had the path. I was like, wait a minute, what, what's the, what's my personal experience that I can just lay out? No, 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 it doesn't work like that. Now you've just got to come up with it yourself. And the last thing I'll say is, so one of the, so the beginner's guide with estrangement, the final story, which is about Iran, yeah. actually came out of a, nonfiction piece that I wrote for a magazine. I don't know if you're going to remember way back January 2020. We were about to go to a war with Iran. Ring a That's bell. Weird. Right. Oh, and then oh, that yeah. half. So I wrote a piece for the magazine mm. about that. But then the moment passed. Right. And then the piece is no longer relevant. And now I'm sitting with 2000 words going, what am I going to do with all this work I just did? And then I said, OK, let me turn it into a story. Let me take some part of this turn it into a story, mm. but the story is going to require more, not just word wise, but it's going to require more. It's, it, it can't just be, it's not, a, it's, you can't just press a button and say, once it was fiction, now it's not, uh, sorry, once it was nonfiction, now it's, I had to add something, I had to get a different kind of art going. I had to create stuff. Uh, so whatever, all of that. Yeah. That's all in the mix. That's such a what, good, what's, go ahead. I mean, no, I was just thinking about how like, you know, I, I said this a while ago, but it still hits me how severe it was that like for a lot of us, the worst event of 2020 or the most tense event of 2020 wasn't necessarily the pandemic, but it was like that moment with Soleimani's yes. assassination and then the down, downing of the Ukrainian airliner and then the possibility of war with Iran. It was, I really was like melting down those couple months. I mean, there was so, so, much. so this is an interesting thing because, you know, Given my ethnicity, our ethnicity, you know, minorities in the United States, it's like, so something like that stays with me. And, but I think for other people, and I do it too, it just goes, you know, the moment passes and then we move on, but those things linger. And here I'll give you the I'll give you the big one, which is the Iran hostage crisis. Yeah. Which I don't know who you know. It, you know, even if you lived through it, you know it's it's receded. But that shit defined me. Yeah. That shit defined me, and like that when we look at America, the title American estrangement. I mean, that was a major aspect of where my feeling of estrangement came up, came from. It wasn't the only one, but it was one and it was very defining. And I was 10, I was 10, 11 and 12, right? Yeah, because it ended at 81, the beginning of 81. So I was like, you know, 
444 day. Um, but I, but that's not, that's not at the tip of everyone's lips. And I understand that, but you know, for some people that's the trauma and then you live with it forever. It doesn't go away. Other people forget it. So yeah, January, 2020 is another, is like, oh, is this it? Is this the big one? Yeah. Here we go. I think that's so, I mean, I immediately loved your title and I think about that so much because a lot of times people will think like, well, you Iranians, what's wrong? You should just be happy. You guys right. blend in. You da, da, da. What's wrong? It must be easy to be an American if you're an Iranian, you know, you pass. Da, da, da. But it's like our entry, you know, into this country, because I was also, you know, I was a little bit younger, but I was still, that was like very scary moment for me coming to America right at the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war after the revolution. And then just being faced with so much hatred, like, just like being a mm -hmm. young child and just being hated for who you are, like relentlessly. Mm -hmm. And that never really went away completely. I mean, Iran has always been sort of hated, but like it was very intense in those years. And it's like, how can you expect us? It's just so hard. I don't know how, like, like when people make these comments, it's just very weird to me. Like, like I still find myself really struggling sometimes to trust Americans and you know, and it's because of that trauma, I know. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, listen, I mean, we've been at the verge of war, it feels like, with Iran since 1979. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, and I don't know, like, it, in January 2020, it was like, oh, this is really going to happen now. Yeah. This yeah. is, now it's going to happen. And then it passes. Nope, it didn't happen. But the reverberations are still, by the way, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to plug you. <laughs> Thank here you. we go brown album i mean and and speaking of iran and writing about iran and and i know my agent's going to be pissed because i'm making this about you but one of the stories i stories well story sure this is all personal essay but you wrote a piece um about going on a camel ride when you were a little girl yes What's, what's the title of that i i um uh, is, camel is, ride is, los angeles 1986 that's right um, speaking of hitting the note of humor, pathos perfectly, uh, and I felt like, I mean, that, no, I haven't experienced that. And our, and our trajectories have been different in this country. Yeah. I mean, I was born here, you were born in Iran, but that the feeling of shame that you write about, and your dad's oblivious, and understandably, because it's like, that's not hit. It's a really, t it's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful piece. Thank it's you a so great much. Yeah. It, it's so funny because that camel ride, they, it, 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 I, several years ago, me and an old partner were in Oakland and we were at an Airbnb and there was like camel printed like sheets. It was like probably like Urban Outfitters sheets with some trendy camel thing. And I remember like I walked into the room and I saw and I was like, oh. <gasps> And he was like, what's wrong? You know, this is like a nice room. And I was like, oh my God, the cam. And I immediately had the most paranoid thought. I was like, did they know that a Middle Eastern person was going to stay here? Mm. Like I, I have, I like struggle still to this day, sure. like being around people, like joking about camels because, and I've, and I've realized when I talk about it to my students, like they don't even remember that, like the term camel jockey, what that even means partially yeah. because it's just so nonsensical what a weird slur you know it's such a like <laughs> weak and annoying right. slur right but it was like such a big one and it's like you know it's it's this stuff is really and th thank you for saying nice things about brown album it's so kind of you i mean it's like it's just very it's it's a very unique our identity i mean everyone's identity is unique obviously but to be iranian and given our positioning like in the region and our positioning here and all of our different stories and like what that means and how we center ourselves it's, it's a very complicated identity it's and super complicated hey sorry yeah. to interrupt because i just want to add one thing to that it's also like i mean it's 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 um it's also contingent on so many factors like just going back to me being in during the hostage crisis. So listen, if there had been no hostage crisis, if I had grown up in the 60s in the United States, totally different experience, totally different experience, totally different feeling of what it means to be an American. If I had also grown up in a different city, like if I had grown up, if I had been in New York City during the hostage crisis, I mean, I, I'm assuming, I think it would have been a different experience where I was around other people, other minorities. It wasn't just gonna be me. They were used to having people with, 
different names, strange names. Um, it could have also been a lot worse than Pittsburgh too. But, you know, given like, for instance, my dad, he's full Iranian. I mean, he's got an accent. He was born in Iran. He came here, but he came here in the fifties. He came here as a college student. He was at the university of Minnesota. I think it was a whole different thing for him. I think it was a whole, Iran was not the enemy then. The right. Shah, we were loving the Shah then. We were loving right. Iran then. We were, the, they were our allies. They were our big ally in the Middle East then. So some of this is just based on sort of timing, time and place. Yeah, and it's it's not a linear, like, uh, a, it's not like a linear trajectory the way it is maybe for certain immigrant groups or, or certain people. It's very like, yeah, topsy-turvy and just kind of depends yeah. on one year in our history can be such a big difference. Yes. And it's so funny. I mean, uh, it's it, it, another like question I had that I wanted to ask you too is, is someone recently asked me like, what are my like final goals as a writer as if I'm about to die? <laughs> that I'm at What's your bucket list? What's your writer authority? It, 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 yeah, it was kind of this thing. And I thought actually of you because I was thinking like, I remember the conversation we had in the car once in New Mexico and we were talking about this and we were talking about the New Yorker and I... I'm so proud of you for being in the New Yorker so much in a very special way because my one goal still, now that I'm on my fifth book and I'm at my, very happy with my publishers and I feel like I've done many of the things I wanted to in this career. My one goal, my one lingering goal is to one day, I've been published in online in the New Yorker, but I still want to have a short story or an excerpt one day. I've, I've had close calls, but I just wanted to ask you, like, how does that feel? I mean, with this and the last collection, you had quite a lot of stories in the New Yorker you know, you're now like in my brain, I'm happy to say you are a New Yorker writer in many senses of the word. Is that like, so it's a twofold question. How does that feel? Do you feel like, do you identify with that? And then like in putting these books together, is that like a, cause also like, you know, when I was like putting together Brown album, curating it and like kind of putting together like essays was actually much harder than I thought it would be. And so I imagine like, I have a short story collection I'm working on. It's kind of like difficult, like to figure out how to put it all together. And so that was also like an issue to me. Like, I love how beautifully these are put together and like how it works as a whole. So sorry, it's kind of complicated too. No, no, no. The, the second part first. Um, so you were saying like, which stories to include? Is this your fifth book, by the way? The fifth book is going to be my, no yeah, Tarantulas, my next book oh. is going to be the fifth. And then my short story collection is going to be the sixth, I think. Oh, sixth book, sweet. And then oh, I so want to Tarantulas is, is, that's a novel? Yeah. Okay, okay. And so this, and so are you wondering like, which stories do I decide on what to include or like what how, the yeah, yeah, like how do you even like figure out putting together like a short story collection is actually much harder than people think, I think. Well, for me, it was one that I hit a critical mass that could become a book. Um, and when I looked at that, you know, I had the stories before I had the title American Estrangement. The first thought I was gonna do was Beginner's Guide to Estrangement, but kind of long. And also it sounded like I might be, it might be a little talking down to the reader. Like, am I saying you're the beginner? Yeah. And that's not what I intended. So anyway, um, and I saw the sort of the thematic um, heartbeat throughout all of these stories. Uh, you know, I mean, there were no stories that I left out. Mm -hmm. This, these were the seven stories I had. Um, when you're no, making, when you're composing them, do you think about them going into a collection together? Cause they, yes, yes, ah, yeah, yes, great. yeah, I do. I do. Um, I mean, I'm working on more stories now and I'm seeing, seeing that I'm seeing, okay, if I, you know, how much to write, what would they be about? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking book, I'm thinking book. Wow. But, to, and then to answer the first part, it's great. It's, it's, it's great and it never gets old. It never gets old. I, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be in the New Yorker. Um, it's so exciting. Yeah. Whenever I see your name in there, I like just cheer. It's so exciting. Cause it's a big deal. It's not easy. This yeah. is like, you know, I, my old mentor, Stephen Dixon, I think submitted to the New York or something like five dozen times or something like a really like a long time. And it's such a, it's, it's something to never take for granted. And I just love that, like, you know, I don't even know if you were the first 
Iranian American short story writer, but I sort of think of you that way in the New Yorker. Is that correct? I think that might be. I don't know. I don't know. I do remember that you made a comment when I was first published. Yeah. And you said you were very kind. You were congratulatory. And you said you had always been concerned that when someone from Iran got published in the New Yorker that it would be accompanied by, I think you said like um, a carpet or something like the, the, the artwork yeah. would be a carpet. And you were so glad that that's not what had happened. Yeah. And that was very painful. Cause the I think that goes back to everything. fetish like, trash, you know, you worry yeah. about that stuff. Yeah. But it goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's like in our writing, this is where we get to be the, the, the many, many of ourselves, our different selves. It's not, I mean, for me, you know, my name has always preceded me and, um, and it's, it's what everybody sees first. And so it's been a wonderful relief to not have to do that and to be able to talk about other aspects. Um, but yeah, in that, no, being in the New Yorker is, 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 it's wonderful. Yes. It's, so, it's really great. It's kind of funny speaking about our names too. It's funny to be like visible Iranian American writers. And we probably have the most like difficult to pronounce names of yeah. all the Iranians. Like, like we're, our names are like definitely on the harder part. And it's funny because I always bring up to people when they ask me how to pronounce my last name, I mentioned that you once told me that I was actually pronouncing my last name incorrectly. <laughs> audacity i love it did i do that yeah oh by the way one last thing sorry this is totally i just remember us being in uh in santa fe and talking about faulkner and also you have a you have a faulkner piece in here because you love faulkner and but talking about absalom absalom which you were trying to explain what was great about it and why i was because i was like i'm sorry i cannot get into this i have no (laughs) idea it was one of the least pleasant reading experiences of my life (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, I think you actually said he's very popular in Iran. Did you tell me that? Yes, Faulkner is very popular wow. in, in, but both in like um, in Arab speaking countries as well as oh. Iran, they love it. And it's like, it's, I think just that sort of like maximalist prose, just like, like, you know, Iranians vibe better with it, if you will. Really? But also just like the, you know, talk of like aristocracy, reconstruction era, complicated things around like race and identity. And I, I think those issues just sort of like appeal to like, you know, and, and have like parallels with our regions. Interesting, um, interesting. I think, you know. How are they, tra- is, how's the translation? Does that have to do with this? I've it- only seen a few translations and it's like interesting because the more like, I hate the term stream of consciousness, but let's just call it that, that sort of like, language I feel like becomes like poetry in Farsi very easily and so it actually kind of works more than you would think actually because you know I don't know it's it's it, it has um like I think of like Quentin Compson's like repetitions and the sort of like biblical like fixation and even like the biblical like ebbs and flows of the language they kind of actually end up working well with like Farsi and Arabic you know, more so I would think than say like a language like, I don't know, German or Japanese or something. I'm guessing though, you know, I don't know, but it seems like that's a big thing. Um, but all, you know, it's, it's like, I think this, I was talking to a friend of mine who's been around, you know, staying with me and she's from the South. And I just think there's so many, um, similarities between the Southerners and like people who are Persian in many ways, like whether it's like certain etiquettes and certain, um, stylists of humor that also kind of come from like a, a difficult or dark past or all that, you know? So it's, it's like fascinating, uh, all this stuff. Um, I don't know. It's so cool. I want to make sure if there's anybody who has any questions. Oh, here's John. John's got a question. The question yeah. is time's up. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> I always go over. There's, that. we don't have any questions from the audience, but it is indeed the top of the hour though all right i would be happy to listen to both of you talk for thank you many more hours start John, a podcast I love your setup, by the way you've got like the totally professional is that a mic i'm seeing there yeah, yes nice. i got the i love it oh my god the mic amazing. on loan from our 
from our wow. my colleague Sam, who was doing our podcast with us for a long time when we used to have office, it. coming in the store. Um, I don't have a ring light, but <laughs> you know, I make a do. <laughs> Um, thank you both so much for joining us at Home with Literati this evening. Thank you. Um, such a wonderful conversation. Hopefully we can have you in the store oh. uh, in, in the not too distant future. Here, here's the two books to buy from Literati. Thanks. You can buy them at the links directly yep. below okay, me awesome. on YouTube or in the chat. Um, but yeah, I hope we can have you in the store. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us as well. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.